Thank you very much. Okay. I'm just going to tell the story of Zain Abu Zubaydah. There's many other themes and discussions you folks have been dealing with, with time, with pain, with immorality, and I'm going to leave that to the others. I'm simply going to tell the story of one person who does symbolize much of what's taking place in Guantanamo. And I say that without in any attempt involved, disputing there are many other symbols of this, but I'm talking about Zain Abu Zubaydah. I've represented him for quite a long time. I am his co-counsel now with Colonel Higgins of the Military Commission Defense, and she and I together are representing him in Guantanamo. Now, many years ago, um, I remember being asked if I would join, represent some people in Guantanamo, and I said, sure. And I said, yeah, I'm a trial lawyer. I said I could sit there saying I could hardly wait for the moment when I would say, call your first witness and we'll start the trial. Well, I'm still waiting for that moment, although Colonel Higgins and I have some hope of being able to start on that with one of our two clients. It's a little difficult to be that optimistic about Zain Abu Zubaydah because his issues are most difficult. And that is that it's, he, was, he was shot, captured and shot on March 28, 2002. He was in terrible shape. The American government believed that he had a lot of valuable information. They arranged for surgeons to be flown out to help him with his surgery to save his life. They spent a great deal of time dealing with that and they had concluded that he knew a great deal of useful information. So much so they would fly people from the United States to do the surgery. At a period of time shortly thereafter that, they began to start interrogating him and the CIA hired its first contractors, the torturers, Mitchell and Jessen, and they began what was the informal torture program. During a period of time, they were trying to legalize the torture program, partly because the illegality of what they were doing could lead, in some other administration, to prosecutions. Whether you call torture a crime or not, beating people, hitting people, and engaging in a variety of other assaults, some of which lead to death, are crimes with or without the word torture. So their biggest problem was that Abu Zubaydah was the first person ever captured by the CIA. And he was the first person that the CIA ever attempted to interrogate since basically the end of the Vietnam War. And they began, and as they began, it was dealing with a man who was badly wounded and in a great deal of pain. And they began to realize that they needed to get some legal justification for it. America's torture program began on August 2nd, 2002. And that's when the White House, the West Wing of the White House, had completed negotiating with the Department of Justice for a memos approving certain kinds of techniques that would justify using, to, to, that would be authorized. So they had those techniques approved. Now that was done on August 2nd. On July 24th, the CIA produced a memo for the Department of Justice explaining why Abu Zubaydah should be tortured. Because the torture memos were written solely and exclusively and by name to torture Zain Abu Zubaydah. And in that memo, they listed a series of things justifying why he should be tortured. One was he was the number two Al-Qaeda leader Another was he had been coordinating the 9-11 attacks. A third was he'd been coordinating plans involved in all attacks against the US and allies almost everywhere in the world for the past few years. And they went through a series of other examples that were quite specific. And then August 2nd, they started their torture techniques. And they used all 10 of the torture techniques without stop for 17 days. That's now been confirmed by State Department cables that exist reporting what was happening for the first 12 days, and there's other documentation showing what took place thereafter. And the remarkable thing was that this 
report that you were referring to, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, established the fact that the factual predicate upon which he was being tortured, each one of them, was actually unfounded. And not only were they unfounded, it turns out that the, the CIA, when they wrote them, knew they were not true. They were presented to justify the creation of a torture program which would last, and in, has never really been refuted, it was created to be used on him and thereafter on many others, including people in this room. He was the recipient of all 10 torture techniques, one after the other. Not everybody was tortured to the same extent and as often as it might be. But by 2006, the CIA had changed and was forced to admit publicly that he wasn't the number two Al-Qaeda or the number three, or that, and they had to admit that he also was not a member of the 9-11 um, events. And in fact, they conceded that he was not and had never been a member of Al-Qaeda. And what's quite shocking about this is that when you read the Senate report, which was not published until December of 2014, it was learned thereafter that the CIA knew from the very beginning that the facts they presented were false. And my students who've done a great deal of the research, some of this hard, long, arduous research was not done by me. But uh, they'd gone through a great deal of these materials and they had gone through, and one of my students said, why would you invent a person who didn't exist in order to torture him to get information you knew he didn't have? Which is actually a difficult question to answer. And of course, the real answer was they didn't care about him. They only cared about the right to create a program. And one of the interesting questions about the United States has not addressed in the public published portions of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, and I still don't have the answer to it to this day. If it turns out that it's true, and they don't dispute it, that he wasn't Al-Qaeda, why would you want to torture somebody to find out what he knew as a member of Al-Qaeda if you knew he wasn't ever a member of Al-Qaeda? What would be the purpose? And I think the answer has to be that they needed a, want, a chance to legally justify experiments trying to determine what, in fact, the techniques were that would work. Now, on a question of torture, it's kind of interesting. You know, torture isn't new. Every country all the time, especially when they're scared, looks for a magic bullet, some way to find out truth, some way to know what's going on, and it didn't begin with 9-11. Certainly was happening in Vietnam, but it also happened in Korea, it happened in China, it happened in Russia, it happened in the Nazi Germany world, it happened in Florence, the Romans did it. Torture is, everybody is always looking for a new way to do it, and everybody keeps thinking they'll find the secret to sort of determine the truth. Well, it doesn't work. I think that's been proven once again. But that leads me back to the problem of Abu Zubaydah. Colonel Higgins and I are trying to get the government to say, call your first witness. But think of the problem. The CIA invented a torture program, and to do so, they invented a person and used Abu Zubaydah's name to get permission to experiment in this way. And after they did so, they, it was, and it's become established, he was never the person they said he was. Now the question is, if Colonel Higgins or I say, call your first witness, who are they gonna call? Because they can't call a witness who said he's Al-Qaeda, they can't identify him with any sort of enemies that could take place and there are no actions. And the ultimate frustration for not just Colonel Higgins and myself, but of course, Zain Abu Zubaydah is, how can I have a trial? How soon? And then of course, our really frustrating thing, think of this as lawyers, how do you have a trial when the government knows they haven't committed a crime? How can you have a trial if they haven't committed a crime and there's no evidence of a crime? 
So when Zain Abizabeda, when we go see him, he is quite, I was going to say, everybody was explaining how there's no anger in Guantanamo, and his, and none of the detainees have anger in the way you'd expect, because people can't live with anger. But I would like to point out that Colonel Higgins and I when were talking about this earlier. He may not have anger, but boy is he irritable with me. <laughs> when I don't do my homework. And the homework sometimes is a long list. And uh, most recently, I wasn't there and Colonel Higgins was, and she said, boy, are you in trouble the next time you're going to go back. But he's an engaging person. He's a bright person. And he's a peaceful person. And he did not commit any of the actions that anybody might imagine, and in fact, one of the irritating things for him is that when he was captured and shot, he was carrying with him a diary, a contemporaneous diary that he'd written since 1990, since he was uh, 20 years old. And in that diary, there are all sorts of facts, which absolutely disproved many things. And they translated the diary in 10 days, so they had it. And while it isn't very elegantly translated, and he's a little offended by some of the sloppy ways in which the CIA chose to translate his life's work, the fact of the matter is that the diary confirms well that he had been requested to join Al-Qaeda by Osama bin Laden, and he'd refused. He was ideologically opposed to many of the things that Osama bin Laden was advocating, and he refused to do it, and in fact, in relationship to this, Osama bin Laden closed the non-Al-Qaeda training camp that he operated. So I think when, I, when talking about him as a person, I'm not trying to talk about him as the human being that we know him to be. He is quite a warm, engaging person. He has interesting uh, traits. He is perfectly willing to be direct. He can also tell stories. He has some humor. But you know, he's been locked up when you talk about what's here. Most of the stories that we've been talking about people are out. I think he fears, and it's not without reason, that unless people pay attention to the fact that the one person clearly, admittedly, not justifiably detained cannot get a trial and cannot be released because he's innocent. And you know, I'd just like to close with the fact that you know, if you're a lawyer, you spend most of your life trying to prove people are innocent. But what you don't do is say, please prosecute my client. So we're down there pleading for them to prosecute him. And the last time I was there, I said, you know, you've got a lawyer who's so terrible, referring to myself, not Colonel Higgins. You've got a lawyer who's so terrible, he can't even get his client charged with a crime. And he said, well, you just do the best that you can. So thank you.